In today's top story, we're reminded why truth is often stranger than fiction. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer the like button a beer and then give them an oduls. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. a young woman named Melissa finally moved out of her mother's house and got her own place across town. For the first few months she was living there, she never noticed anything strange. But about three months into living there, things started to get a little bit weird. It started with a whole bunch of hang-up calls where someone from different numbers would call, she'd answer, and she could hear them breathing, but they weren't saying anything. And then she started getting these huge bouquets of flowers delivered to her front step, but they were delivered from Anonymous. Then after that, she started noticing things in her kitchen and her living room were going missing. Things like plates, cups, drink coasters, salt shakers, forks and knives, little things, but since she lived alone and she was the only one moving these things, they really stood out. Melissa had this habit that every time she went to bed, she would unplug her TV. She had this irrational fear, if she didn't do that, that it would spark a fire and her house would burn down in the middle of the night. So she was pretty obsessive compulsive about always making sure the TV was unplugged before she went upstairs to bed. And so one night around the same time she's getting these hang up calls and there's flowers being sent to her door and things are going missing, she unplugs her TV and she goes up to bed. The next morning she gets up and comes downstairs and the TV's plugged in again. She convinces herself that, well, she must have forgot to unplug the TV. As rare of an event as that is, it has to be what happened. And so that night she unplugs the TV and remembers looking directly at the plug, confirming that yes, I've unplugged the TV. And then she puts it down and looks again at the outlet. It's not plugged in. It's definitely not plugged in. And then she goes upstairs to bed. The next morning, when she walks downstairs she had the sense of dread that when she turned the corner because her TV was right at the bottom of the stairs that when she turned the corner it would be plugged in again and her worst nightmare would come true that something is happening on my first floor when I'm asleep at night and as she comes down the stairs and turns the corner what does she see the TV is plugged in again she's horrified but has no idea what to do it's not some malicious act and she's telling herself well, maybe I forgot again, but then she's like, no, I remember last night staring at the plug. I definitely unplugged it. And so she flies around her first floor to make sure one, everything is locked, but two, no one else is in here. And when she's satisfied that, yup, it's empty down here, and two, everything is locked, she sits there thinking, well, now what do I do? Do I call the police and say, someone's plugging in my TV? You know, she can't do anything. And it was at this point that Melissa developed a very real fear of her first floor. And she began going to bed so early at night because she could not be on that floor when it started to get dark. And so imagine living alone, being afraid of going down to your first floor, how scary it would be at night when you're laying in bed, your door's shut, and any noise you hear in the house, you're gonna attribute to your first floor. And so Melissa was living this absolutely wretched life where she's scared of everything outside of her bedroom. And so with that as context, Melissa goes to bed one night super early, probably like three o'clock. The sun's not even down yet, but she's upstairs. But eventually it does get dark outside and she still has not fallen asleep. And so she sits up in bed and she turns on the TV. And right away, the channels on the screen start to change. And she's thinking, oh, I must be laying on the remote. But then she remembers the remote's in my hand. And so she's looking at the remote and then she's looking at the TV. She's not touching her remote and the channels are still cycling. Now, Melissa had what's called a skybox, which means her downstairs TV was connected to her upstairs TV and vice versa. If one was changing the channel, in real time, the other changed the channel. And so as she's looking at her remote and not touching it, and looking at the screen as the channels are changing, it dawns on her that someone downstairs is changing the channels. And so frozen in fear, all she can think to do is turn off her TV because that's the one function that does not have any impact on the other TV. So she turns the TV off. And so in total darkness, in a house she's already terrified of, she is straining her ears to try to hear some sign that this is either something, someone's down there flipping through channels, 
or this is nothing, and I just happened to turn the TV on when the skybox was malfunctioning. And as she's sitting there, all she can hear is her own breathing, and she can feel the pounding of her heart in her chest, but she doesn't hear any sounds in her house. She doesn't hear the TV on. She doesn't hear footsteps, doors opening, none of that. It's silence in the house. So after what probably felt like an eternity, she just grabbed a pillow and clutched it in front of her and put her head into the pillow and just laid like that until she eventually fell asleep. The next morning when she gets up, the sun is out and it's this huge relief because suddenly with the sunlight pouring in the windows, it was like the house wasn't scary anymore. And she's telling herself, you know what, that had to have been just some anomaly with the skybox. I bet I go downstairs and the TV's unplugged. And so she goes downstairs and the TV is unplugged. And so that for her kind of confirms that, okay, the paranoia is getting to me. I'm losing my mind a little bit. I gotta tell someone what's going on. And so as it happens, that day she was going to a family birthday party. And so when she gets there, she pulls her older brother aside and says, here's the strange things that are happening in my house with the skybox and all this. And at first he looked at her like, really? This is what's going on? You're seeing ghosts in your house? But when she really focused on the specific things that were happening, like the plug going back into the wall two separate times, and then the skybox thing. So the TV is kind of wrapped up in the weirdness that's been happening in her house and the missing items in her house. And so for the brother, it all kind of added up to, okay, this does seem a little bit weird. And he offered to live with her for a few days and just see it for himself. And as they're talking, their younger brother happens to walk by, overhears the conversation and says, oh, I'll stay there too. For four days, the two brothers lived on the first floor of Melissa's house and they don't see anything, they don't hear anything. It's completely ordinary. And Melissa at first was reassured, but then started to think, does that mean whoever's been doing this stuff is watching my house really closely and knows that I have, you know, protection at my house right now and they're staying away. Does that mean I'm being watched really closely? And so finally, when her brothers are getting ready to leave after the fourth day, she was practically begging them to stay. She couldn't stand the idea of staying in this house. Her brothers reassured her that she had nothing to worry about, but if she experienced anything weird, Anytime, any day, just call or text and they would be there in a heartbeat. Although she did not feel reassured, it was starting to get late, at least by her standards, it was like three o'clock. So the sun's getting close to going down, so she needs to go upstairs. So she goes back in her house and does like 20 trips around her house to confirm everything is shut, everything is locked, no one's in the house, everything is safe, and then she goes upstairs to bed. But like most nights, she was so scared of everything outside of her bedroom door that she couldn't sleep. And as she's laying there in utter silence in her room, she hears the unmistakable sound of her back door opening. And she hears footsteps walking through her first floor. And then she hears the TV turn on and her brothers have been watching her TV last and they had the volume set really, really high. So as soon as the TV went on, it blared all through the house. And immediately the TV turned back off because whoever turned it on knew that that was gonna wake up whoever was in the house. Melissa doesn't know what to do. Before, whatever the heck was happening in her house was a little bit subtle. It was like she had to think about what she was hearing to confirm it was actually happening. Now, this person is just strolling into her house in the middle of the night and flipping on the TV and blaring it through the house. And so she immediately is like, oh my God, what do I do? And she picks up her phone and she calls her brother. Then he picks up right away and she goes, someone is in the house. The brother's like, I will be there in 10 minutes. Do not leave your bedroom. Don't do anything. Stay on the phone with me. So Melissa's shaking out of fear and she gets up as slowly as she can and she walks over to the window to get as far away from the door, which was locked as she possibly could. And she's glancing out the window, waiting to see her brother pull up as she listens for any sign that this person downstairs has begun walking upstairs. Finally, Melissa sees out of the corner of her eye, her brother's car pulls up across the street and he, along with her younger brother, hop out. They run across the street towards her house. They hop over the fence and they run down the alley between her house and her neighbors and they go towards the back out of sight. She's still on the phone with him and she's saying, do you see him? Do you see him? Do you see him? Do you see him? And he says, hold on. He goes to the back of the house where he knows you can look in and basically see the whole first floor. And as soon as he gets to that spot where she's expecting him to give her a report and he pauses, there's silence on the phone and she goes, what do you see? And he says, okay, yep, there is someone in your living room right now. I'm gonna hang up and call the police and I'm gonna call you right back. Now, Melissa knew what she heard was very real to her, but to have it confirmed by her brother right now took this to a whole nother level of fear. Now she's legitimately fearing for her life. 
There is a person, an intruder, in my house right now. Confirmed. They are right downstairs. And they've been coming into my house probably for weeks. And so her brother hangs up the phone and begins calling the police. Meanwhile, Melissa is just standing in this room, horrified, as she listens to a stranger walk around the first floor of her house. But because she was hearing the footsteps clearly downstairs, she decided she would just walk over to her door and look through the keyhole, which was oversized on her door. And if you looked through it and over to the left, you'd actually look downstairs to the first floor. You'd only see a sliver of the first floor. And so very carefully, she walks her way over to the door. And as she kneels down to look through the keyhole, her phone rings. It was in her pocket and it wasn't on silent. It was on loud and it was her brother calling back. And she kind of fumbles for her phone. She drops it on the ground. It's still ringing. And she finally silences it. And then reflexively, she pokes her head back and looks through the keyhole. And standing at the bottom of the stairs, looking up at her, is a man with a hat pulled over his eyes who's clearly heard the sound and he begins walking up the stairs she's falling over backwards screaming at the top of her lungs to get her brothers inside she hears them come charging inside she hears this epic struggle on the stairs and she hears this person who's in her house because it was a voice she didn't recognize screaming i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry and then it's quiet and so she opens that door because she wants to help if she can and she looks and she sees her brothers have this man pinned on the stairs he's not moving and she sees her younger brother is holding something and he holds it up to her and he just shakes his head and it's a freaking knife. And then she puts it together that the stranger in her house was carrying this knife. And before she can even take that information in, the older brother takes the hat off of this guy and it's their mother's ex-boyfriend from 10 years ago. The same one they all believed had an inappropriate attraction to Melissa. Police show up and take him away and he quickly admitted to sneaking into her house for months. They don't know how he got in and he would never tell them, but he admitted that, yep, yeah, I was breaking in almost every single night, but he never gave a good reason why. He just started doing it. Police cited mental illness as the likely culprit for why he was doing it. And the family believed this could be something more sinister, but either way, he was given three years in jail and the family, once again, cut all ties with him. In February of 2013, a young woman named Kim finally moved out of her parents' house and she moved into this tiny little apartment that she absolutely loved. Kim had severe social anxiety. She could not stand being out in public, talking to people she didn't know. And so she would do everything in her power to stay indoors. She had a job that didn't require her to travel. And so having this little apartment was like her little oasis. When she was there, she was safe. If she had to leave, she was practically running to her car and running back so she didn't have to talk to anybody. In those first few weeks she was living there, as much as she tried to avoid all contact with other people, there was one person she was kind of forced to have an interaction with, and that was her landlord. But her landlord turned out to be this awesome some old woman named Olivia who really took a liking to Kim and kind of looked at Kim as like her daughter. And Kim was surprised at herself for wanting to interact with Olivia. She was very comforting and she was this really nice lady. And so even though they didn't actually interact that much, they developed this relationship where Olivia liked to make food and she'd come over to Kim's door and she'd knock and she'd leave it outside of her door and she didn't expect Kim to come out and talk to her. She knew Kim was uncomfortable being out in public and so she didn't push her to do that. Instead, she just expected her to eat some nice food and whenever Kim was done eating, to put her dishes back outside the door and Olivia would take it up and she would go clean it and that was that. And so Kim really grew to love Olivia and was very happy to have her there. It was like she made her feel safe. Two months after moving into this tiny little new apartment, Kim started taking a new medication for her anxiety. Now, historically, she had taken a whole bunch of different medications and knew when you start a new one, it's not uncommon to have a whole bunch of side effects that you're just not used to and they're kind of awful and you need some time to get used to them. So at the same time she's taking this new medication, she starts to notice that she's forgetting things. Things in her apartment are being put in places she does not remember putting them. And things are going missing and she can't remember where she put them. And so even though she was expecting side effects from this new drug, she was really frustrated with the memory loss. She also noticed this medication made her exceptionally drowsy to the point where most days she had to take a nap for two or three hours in the middle of the day just to get through the day. Because Kim had such intense anxiety about being out in public, 
she did not want to go to the doctors to get a different prescription or to even talk to the doctor about, you know, is this normal? Because that doctor's visit would necessitate a whole bunch of interactions with people she doesn't want to interact with. And so she decided, you know what? I'm just going to take my medication. I'm going to let myself adjust to this new normal and everything will be just fine. During the time period that she's experiencing all these side effects that she is attributing to her new medication, she got a delivery from Olivia. It was a Greek salad that she knew Kim loved and Kim psyched about this Greek salad. She brings it in her apartment and she decides, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna have a nice day to myself. I'm gonna go in my bedroom. I'm gonna turn on Netflix and I'm gonna eat this salad in bed. It's gonna be awesome. And so she's sitting in bed, she's eating her salad, she's watching Portlandia and then she falls asleep right in the middle. Like as she's eating her salad, she's falling asleep. She's so tired. When she woke up, she's like, wow, I, I've never fallen asleep that hard and that fast before. And she's literally still got the fork in her hand from eating her salad. And then she notices on the other side of the bed, the left side of the bed, the sheets are all disturbed, like someone has been laying there. And Kim always sleeps on the right side of the bed. It was almost like a compulsion for Kim that she could never sleep on the left side, like it was bad luck. And she reaches her hand out and she feels that side of the bed where it's been disturbed and it's still warm. And so she quickly thinks to herself, well, I guess I must have rolled over and laid on that side of the bed and then rolled back to this side, just miraculously right back in the same position I was in with the salad fork still in hand. And that's when it kind of clicks in her head, like that's not possible, that's not possible. So what does that mean? Does that mean someone's in my apartment right now? And so she leaps out of bed, she gets her phone, she enters 911 and she's ready to dial it. And she flips on all the lights in her apartment. She's running around and there's no one in her apartment. The apartment's still locked, everything is normal. And so she puts her phone away and her heart's still racing. She's very stressed out about what's just occurred. Because in her mind, in the back of her mind anyways, she knows she didn't roll over, that didn't happen. This is when Kim began to wonder, are all these strange happenings in my apartment connected to what just happened now? Because this incident right here does not feel medication side effect driven. And so all of a sudden she's looking at the other weird things in her apartment, like the missing toothbrush and the missing shoes and things getting moved around as suddenly connected. And it dawns on her that maybe she's been blind to something else happening. Maybe someone is breaking into my apartment. So for the next couple of days, Kim watched her apartment like a hawk to see if there was any indication of somebody breaking into her apartment at any point. And there was nothing. She always locked the door. She always kept the windows shut. The only thing that stood out to her was when she woke up in the mornings, her bedroom had a very distinctive smell to it. It wasn't her smell and it wasn't a smell she was used to. It was like another person's smell and it really freaked her out. She decided it's time to tell my parents. And so when she tells her parents and she's describing out loud what's been going on in her apartment, it's the first time she's hearing herself say this stuff out loud. And it sounds way more creepy and way more scary than it did in her own head. And so as she's telling them, she's becoming scared to go back to her apartment. And her dad picks up on that and says, hey, I'll go back with you. We'll look around your apartment and we'll make sure it's it's safe and secure. And then on the way out, we'll check in with your landlady and we'll let her know what's going on. So she's brought in and everything's gonna be fine. They go back to her apartment, they go inside and when they walk in, everything looks normal. They kind of do a walk through the apartment, looks normal. But before her dad leaves, he says, hey, let me just do a closer inspection of your whole apartment. Let me look everywhere and make sure there's not like some special way to get in here just to give you peace of mind. And so he went into her bedroom and he starts looking around and he's lifting up the mattress and looking underneath. And then he opens up her closet, which is this big closet, lots of clothes in there. It's not quite a walk-in closet, but it's big enough that you can easily stand in there. And her father reaches in and splits the clothes and he uses his light to look at all of the back wall and he pushes on it and he taps on it and he sees if there's any sort of special compartment there's not but before he walks out again he notices a little blurb of writing on the bottom right corner of the inner wall an area that you could only see if you were standing in the closet looking for strange things on the wall of the inside of this closet he kneels down to take a look at it and it's this little tiny blurb of text that says come back here so I can look at you and the only way you could write it is if you were laying down in this tiny little corner facing the exit of the closet and that's when her father looks at the bottom of the closet and one of the slats on the closet door was missing. And so in theory, if you were someone that was writing this message, you'd be laying down where your eyes would be looking through that slat right at her bed. Her father put it together and he stood up. He walked out to his daughter and he said, come over here. He showed her what's in her closet and he said, did you write that? And she goes, 
no. And he goes, all right, it's time to leave. They walk outside, they go to his truck and he calls the police and he says, someone's breaking into my daughter's apartment. Police show up and using CCTV footage, they capture a grown man regularly going into Kim's apartment in the middle of the night and he clearly has a key. It would turn out to be Olivia's grown adult son named Henry who lived with her, who apparently as soon as he saw Kim for the first time, he fell madly in love with her and became very obsessed with her and he developed this fake relationship in his mind where he believed he and Kim were dating, even though Kim didn't even know Henry existed. She didn't even know he was living with Olivia. She had never seen him before. During questioning, Henry said what he did is he got sleeping pills and he ground them up. And anytime his mother was delivering food to Kim, which she loved to do, and she was always excited about it, so she was talking about it, so he would know it was happening. He would put sleeping pills in her food, he would mix it in, and then he knew as soon as it was delivered, she would be asleep. And he would use his mother's spare key to go into the apartment, and what he said he did is he never touched her. He never laid a hand on Kim. Instead, he laid next to her in bed or watched her from inside the closet. So for the four months that Kim lived in this apartment where she believed every time she came inside and shut the doors, that she was kind of away from society, she could just be alone in her bubble, well, in reality, there was some psychopath just a few feet away from her almost the entire time. When Olivia found out about all of this, she made a point to tell Kim she had nothing to do with it and she was terribly sorry, but their friendship ended. On October 17th, 1941, 73-year-old Philip Peters was supposed to join his friends for dinner, but he never showed up. His neighbors knew Phil was living alone at the time because his wife had recently fallen and broken her hip and was in the hospital. And so they were worried about Phil being on his own and they thought, you know what, let's just be sure, let's call the police and have them go over and check on him. When the police arrived at his house, they knocked on the door, no answer. They tried the door handle, it was locked. They tried the other door, that was locked too. They looked in the windows, it was all dark, and they had to get another neighbor who had a key to open the door for them. When they stepped inside, there was blood everywhere, on the walls, on the ceiling, everywhere. And in the middle of the kitchen is Phil Peters, face down, he has been bludgeoned to death. The police immediately draw their weapons and they're looking around the house thinking someone could still be here. And they clear the whole house and there's no one there. And so a whole bunch of detectives converge on the house and they start investigating. And they realize pretty quickly how strange the scene was. Nothing in the house was vandalized. Nothing in the house was stolen and Phil himself was just a very modest, retired auditor. He certainly didn't have any enemies, and so the revenge angle didn't necessarily make much sense. But then you gotta remember that when police first got there before they discovered his body, the house was shut and locked, and there was no sign of forced entry. And so whoever was in there with Phil at the time of his death must have known Phil enough to have a key of their own or have Phil open the door for them. So it made investigators wonder what would motivate some person that's in Phil's inner circle to commit such a heinous crime when the obvious angles such as theft, vandalism, revenge have basically been crossed off. Not to mention there was virtually no evidence of who could have done this with the exception of the murder weapon, which was this big piece of metal called a stove shaker but the person who had used it to kill him had taken the time to meticulously wipe it off. So there was nothing on it, no fingerprints, no anything. So for months, detectives agonized over this case, but they got nowhere. Nine months later, a housekeeper was hired by Phil's widow to help around the house now that Phil was gone. And she said, as soon as she moved in, she started hearing strange tapping sounds all through the house but didn't think anything of it. And so that day, the day she's calling police, she's alone in the Peters residence and she hears the tapping and it's coming from the kitchen. And she thinks, oh, it's gotta be a woodpecker just outside the house, outside the window. And she said, as she looked into the kitchen, on the other side of the kitchen was a door that opened up to a flight of stairs that went to the second floor. And she said it was slowly opening. And out from behind comes this white hand that reaches to the side of the door and begins to pull it open. And she screams and the hand retracts back into the space and then she hears it storm up the stairs and run around on the upstairs before going silent again. She ran out of the house and she ran to a neighbor's house to call the police. The police immediately go to the house and they go inside, guns drawn, and they're looking for this person because they're thinking perhaps the murderer is back and they're looking all through the house and there's nothing. There's not even a sign of a break-in. And so the police go back to the housekeeper and to Miss Peters. 
They explain that we couldn't find anyone, but given the history of your house, we don't think it's safe for you to be in there. And so the housekeeper didn't go back and Miss Peters was moved back to the hospital where she could be looked after during the police investigation. At this point, the police decide we're gonna permanently stake out this house. We're gonna have two detectives that are outside this house watching it at all times. And so two detectives go and they're sitting outside and for a couple of days, they're not seeing anything, they're not hearing anything. And they decide to just go inside and have a look around. They both walk into the house, they go upstairs, they look around, they don't see anything, they go back downstairs. And as they're standing on the first floor getting ready to leave, they hear what sounds like a doorknob turning upstairs. They both heard it, so they go upstairs and they start searching different rooms. And one of the detectives goes into the bedroom and opens up a closet and past all the clothes, bottom left-hand corner, he sees a a foot dart into a little space in the back corner of the closet. And without any hesitation, this guy jumps head first into the closet and grabs the foot of this mystery person who's crawling into a tiny little panel in the back of a closet. And he holds on to this person who's fighting with their life to get away. And he starts pulling them out and he's yelling for his partner to come over. He comes charging in. They both grab this person and they yank this person out. And they would describe him as the strangest looking person they had ever seen. He was super tall, but rare thin and his skin was so dirty it appeared gray. His name was Theodore Conies and he had been living in this house for a year. Before Conies moved in he had fallen on hard times, he was sleeping in alleyways, and as it started to get colder in September of 1941 he decided he would approach his longtime friend Phil Peters and he would ask him for some money and maybe an opportunity to crash at his house for a couple of days, but as it happened when he got to Phil's house Phil wasn't there. Phil was at the hospital visiting his wife who had a broken hip. And so the house was vacant. And Coney saw an opportunity and he broke in. And at first his plan was just to steal food, get warmed up a little bit and then leave. But he noticed when he was looking through the house for things to take, that in the back of one of these closets was a panel that led to this tiny little almost secret attic space that wasn't being used for anything because it was impossibly small. You'd have to be incredibly skinny just to get through the little square opening that would bring you into this little space. And then once you got in, you could only get in by slithering head first in. You couldn't stand up. You had to be laying the entire time. You couldn't extend your legs all the way if you're a full grown adult. So you're kind of tucked up in almost like a pseudo fetal position. But Coney saw this as a huge upgrade from living in the streets and he decided that this is where he's gonna live for the winter. And so he went around the house gathering supplies between blankets and food and water and he filled his tiny little space and then he went back downstairs and he locked the front door again, made sure everything looked the way it was when he showed up. And he went into his little space and shut the door behind him. And when Phil came home that night, he didn't notice anything. And for the next several weeks, Phil never noticed a thing. Every time Phil would leave, Conies would sneak out, go downstairs, make himself some coffee, get a bite to eat, and then go back up to his little space. He even cut into the house's wiring system and stole one of Phil's radios, brought it into the cubby with him, attached it to the new wiring, and he got to listen to the news so he didn't feel so isolated from the outside world. But about a month later, Conies leaves his little spot to go downstairs because he thinks Phil is gone. He gets to the kitchen, he's going through the fridge. When he shuts the fridge, he looks over and there's Phil standing there looking at him like, what are you doing in my kitchen? In a panic, Conies grabs the stove shaker and beats Phil to death. Not knowing what else to do, he wipes off the murder weapon, leaves it where it is. He goes in the fridge, he gets some more food and drink and he goes right back up to where he lives. He would follow the investigation of Phil Peters' death on his radio curled up inside of Phil Peters' house. Conies was quickly found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. After hearing his sentence read to him, he says out loud, now I feel safe. I'll have a better home than I've had in years. So that's gonna do it guys. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. And if you found today's secret, please let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. The first one to do that will get pinned. If you enjoyed the video today and you haven't done this already, please offer the like button a beer, but then give them an O'Doul's. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's gonna do it. See ya.